In the last video, we had this problem of a disc rolling down an inclined plane. And to find the differential equation of motion, we used the Lagrangian, and then we used this equation of constraint to eliminate theta, and then we had our Lagrangian just in terms of x, and then we put it in the Euler-Lagrange formula, and used that to get our differential equation. Now in this video, we're going to solve the same problem, but we're going to use a different method and that method is called the method of undetermined multipliers. It's going to seem like a little bit more work, but we'll get something extra out of it. And that extra thing we'll get out of it is we'll actually find the force of friction between this plane and the disc that actually causes the disc to rotate instead of just sliding down in the first place. So let's jump right in and write down the Euler-Lagrange formula uh, for x and for theta. So for x we have uh, dl, partial of l with respect to x, minus the time derivative of the partial of l with respect to x dot. Now normally this would be everything, but this time we're not going to use this equation of constraint to eliminate theta, and we're just going to add another term to this equation instead. And that term is going to be plus lambda, and this lambda is our undetermined multiplier, which we will determine at some point. But this is where the method of undetermined multipliers gets its name. And then this is multiplying another derivative. So the partial with respect to x. So this was the partial with respect to x, and so is this, of another function, which, which we'll call f. And this f is the equation of constraint. And we're going to write it in a way so that it's something equals zero. So f, f equals, we'll subtract r from both sides, f equals x minus, or r theta, x minus r theta equals zero, right? And now that we've added this term with lambda times the derivative of f with respect to x, where f is the equation of constraint written like this, now all of this equals zero. Now this is everything. Now let's write this with theta instead of with x. So a little bit more room. I'll use this purple color. So partial of L with respect to theta minus the time derivative, time derivative, full time derivative, full time derivative of partial of L with respect to theta dot. And then again, we're going to add this, this extra term here. So lambda, and this lambda is the same lambda in both equations. And we're going to use this, this pair of equations like a system of equations to find lambda later. But anyway, we're going to take the partial of f with respect to theta this time multiplying theta, or, or lambda. And write our f here. I want to draw your attention to what this f is. So that's why I'm using yellow for it. Make it stand out a little bit. Equals zero. So these terms right here with the lambda multiplying this derivative of the equation of constraint, they, these terms probably seem a little bit mysterious right now. So let's try to think about why these things are here in the first place and why they look the way they do. So let's start out by pretending this term doesn't exist and see what we would get. If we don't use our constraint to, to get rid of this theta, then we'll have the partial of L with respect to x. This will be the only term here, right? And this is the potential energy function right here. So this dL dx, this partial of L with respect to x, is just the force due to gravity. Force due to gravity. I'll just write f, we'll write f of g here. Force due to gravity. So this ends up being the, the spatial derivative of this potential energy function. And that's one way of saying what a force is. right? Force times distance equals work, and work is energy. So, so the derivative of energy with respect to distance is force. And we actually talked about that in previous videos, how, how if we're in rectangular coordinates, this term here ends up being the force. And this Euler-Lagrange formula ends up giving us F equals ma. So this term here is the force of gravity. Now this other term here, this ends up being the, the ma term, the mass times acceleration. Mass times acceleration. And that's, 
That's this whole thing here. Right, so we can see that if we take the partial of L with respect to x dot, this is the only term that matters. And then you can do the derivatives yourself and see that this actually equals m times x double dot. And x double dot is just the second derivative of, of the position with respect to time, which is acceleration. So this is ma. So we have that f equals ma, right? Their difference equals zero, assuming this doesn't exist. But we actually know that this isn't the only force. There's also this force of friction keeping this disk from slipping as it, as it goes down this inclined plane. If there were no friction, there would be no torque to make this thing rotate in the first place, right? So it would start up here and it would just kind of slide down without rotating. So this term actually ends up being our force of friction. So I'll write F, F and then sub F. Hopefully that's not confusing. This is just the force of friction right here. So this is some way of taking into account the fact that there is a friction force slowing this thing down. So hopefully it makes some sense now that there should be some term here. And now let's think about why it looks like this. So we could just sort of superficially say that, well, this has a partial with respect to x and it's a force. If we want this to be a force, this should also have a partial with respect to x. And there's some truth to that reasoning, but, but let's think about it in a little bit different way. So let's think about this force term right here. This term is the derivative of the gravitational potential energy with respect to x. So it tells us how this force of gravity does work on this disk to change the potential energy to kinetic energy, right? That's what this does. It tells us about the, the change of the form of energy. In the same way, we can think of this term as a force that tells us how energy is transferred from one form to another. This force of friction causes this disk to rotate as it travels down the incline plane, and that rotation soaks up energy. There's less translational kinetic energy, and that energy gets put into the rotational kinetic energy, and that happens as it rolls down. So, so we need the derivative of something with respect to x because it describes how the energy changes as this thing moves. So it makes some amount of sense that we would take the derivative of this equation of constraint because that talks about how these two things are linked together the the translational kinetic energy which has to do with x and the rotational kinetic energy that has to do with theta so we're taking this derivative here and then since this thing doesn't actually have units of energy the same way the lagrangian does we need this lambda here to give us the right units and tell us that well it actually depends on the radius squared and maybe there is a factor of two or some other number in here as well but essentially, we're keeping track of the way that the energy is transferred from one form to another and giving it the right units with this, with this lambda. So we're taking a derivative to tell us how the energy changes from one form to another, and we're throwing everything, the units and the details of the geometry of what's happening, and sort of praying that it will come out in this lambda when we're all done. And we'll see that it will. All right, so let's take a look at the other equation. and It'll be very similar. So if we take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to theta, we find that none of the terms depend explicitly on theta. So this term will be zero. This term, this term is zero, so we'll cross it out. Right, and that makes sense because if there were no force of friction or, or this, there were no equation of constraint, this thing wouldn't rotate at all, right? It would just slide down without rotating. There'd be no torque to rotate it in the first place. So this, it makes sense that this is zero because then the, the, the angular velocity wouldn't change, right? Or maybe, maybe it could be rotating. If it were initially rotating, it would keep rotating, but it wouldn't change how it's rotating. It would just kind of slide down and the, the rotation and the translation wouldn't be linked. So anyway, this is zero. This term talks about how the rotation changes. And this term, this term is partners with this other term, right? These two lambda, df, these something terms are partners. So this term talked about how energy is taken away from the translational kinetic energy here. And this term talks about where that energy appears, right? It appears in the rotational kinetic energy. So this doesn't have units of force, right? It's a derivative of an angle instead of a distance. And the same thing here. But this is something like a force that causes rotation. And I wonder if that sounds familiar at all. So it turns out that this, this is actually the torque. The torque. And the torque is due to the friction, right? 
So because of this equation of constraint, because of the friction, there's this torque that causes this thing to rotate, right? The disc rotates, the disc rotates, and its angular momentum changes. And th that's what this is, right? This is the time derivative of the angular momentum. So angular momentum, angular momentum. And we could also say something similar about this equation, right? These are forces, these are linear forces, actual forces, and this is the rate of change of linear momentum. So this is linear momentum, and this is the rate of change. So hopefully that helped explain what this method of undetermined multipliers is. And in the next video, we'll go forward and we will get our equations of motion. And we'll also find this lambda, which will give us our force of friction here, and then also the torque on the disk.